so that you see that what I say is true. Right? So I need to see your Bibles, whether they're physical or digital. I know we're in this digital age. I need to write in my, I know, I just, I need to highlight, underline, or listen, if you need note paper, I apologize, I'm old, my brain doesn't work like it once did, so we ran out of bulletins. So we have just <laughs> printer paper that we're using for note paper today. Um, will you forgive your pastor? Um, uh, next week we'll make sure to have them. Um, but if you do need some paper to write on, I know uh, that's how some of you like to and prefer to take notes. Um, there's some back there. Just a quick few announcements before we begin. So, uh, if you don't have a men's group and want to start plugging in with us, we are meeting this Monday, the usual house at Mom and Dad's house in Cherry Hill. Um, if you need the address, just let me know. We'd be glad to get you. Please come join us. We're learning how to read and study your Bible. It was interesting, I was having a conversation with some seasoned saints, Christians that have been Christians for a long, long time. And you know, it's interesting, they honestly confessed that they said they read their Bibles because they know they should, but that they don't always understand it and don't therefore get much out of it. So let me help you. I do this with the men. I do this, I've been doing it with the women. But it's okay to admit if you open up your Bible, if you're just like, okay, what's that saying to me let us help you don't sit in ignorance let us help you please um, the women's study uh, which is scheduled to meet for Monday will still meet however um, the leader is taking a, a break for this particular week there's a lot going on um, with the family with moving and preparing to move and all that kind of stuff so we're still going to meet and it's going to it may just be like a prayer fellowship devotion time women get to talk to women it's great um, <laughs> it's funny from from me leading the men's group you get them together ready here's the men hey we're here with men and then there's silence the women get together hey can we stop talking for a second and actually get into the word you know very dynamic difference but I love you all nonetheless uh, but so both groups are meeting this week um, hope you're enjoying your summer, getting some R&R, &R, pun intended. Um, I know uh, we have a hot schedule for you, so uh, n next Sunday, Ed will be back with his family, and they were in Georgia for like the last two weeks or so. Felt like a year, I know, right? Um, so he's going to actually be leading the study next Sunday. Um, I finally get to go down the shore for a couple of days. It's the only five days in the entire year where Jim can put his feet up and not have to do anything. So, oh, well, now that Elian is here, I will have to do something. Let me clarify that before I get my head chopped off. Yeah, Emily will be doing nothing. It'll be past the baby. Whose turn is it? Um, but we are looking forward to just a week. So next Sunday, Ed will be teaching. And the following week, um, because they're on vacation this week, uh, Gabe will be teaching. He's our youth pastor. Um, he'll be teaching the following Sunday. So uh, I actually will get two weeks off, which is great. Um, just to be able to recharge my batteries and gear up for another year of looking forward to what God is going to do. He's doing some really big things. We saw a couple of new youth, and we've seen some new faces, and we are watching marriages being healed and lives being restored. It's what we live for. And, of course, disciples being made. The day the church stops making disciples is when the doors close. There's really no other purpose that trumps making disciples. And I just pray that the church in America, I was having a sweet conversation with a brother this morning about that, how when churches lose vision of making disciples, go and make disciples, Matthew 28, right? The literal Greek is, as you are going, be making disciples, wherever you find yourself. And so to help us with that, 
I'm excited that we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you will turn there with me. So if you're new, we do verse-by-verse study in this church. So we've been making our way through the book of 1 Corinthians chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We are as far as chapter 12. So you'll want to have your Bibles open there. I also have three other spots we're going to visit. So I want you to thumb mark or write it down if you're a note taker. And the three other spots are Ephesians chapter 4. I'll give you the verses when we get there. So just have it marked at the chapter. It's easier that way. So we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 4, Acts chapter 1, and Matthew chapter 25. I know my men in my study are like, that's more than three references, Jim. You got four. Guess what? It's my method. I'm doing what I want to do. (laughs) (laughs) So again... We're going to be going through 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but we're going to touch in Ephesians chapter 4, Acts chapter 1, and Matthew chapter 25. And let's go to God and let's ask Him to come and visit us and bless the study. Heavenly Father, we thank You in Jesus' name for the incredible gift of salvation. Lord, to think that once we were lost in our trespasses, dead in our sin, and we were enemies with you. And out of your abundant and incredible grace and mercy, you rescued us from hell, from death. You paid the price that we could never afford. Lord, we could never in this life, even if you gave us a million lifetimes to do good, it would never even come close to what it cost to pay for our sin. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. And thank you that every morning, as a believer, we wake up and their mercy is new every morning. Every day, God, you're ready to love on us. You're ready to bless us. You're ready to strengthen us and encourage us, Lord. Would you do that this morning? Fire up for this word that we're going to read. Get excited about being a disciple of Christ. Pour out your spirit and Lord, change us today. Help us to learn and grow in the grace and knowledge of who you are, Lord, because it's all about you. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. I've entitled tonight, tonight, wow. I've entitled today's message, Understanding Spiritual Gifts. Understanding Spiritual Gifts. As we move through chapters 12 and through 14, there's no way, there's so much meat, so I kind of want to break it down. And that's why today's message is just about understanding the gifts. Before we go into the use of the gifts, you need to understand the gifts. And so what I want to do is just read through chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. We're actually only going to focus on verses 1 through 11 and then down in uh, 28 through 31. The middle of the chapter becomes more about the use, but I want us to understand the gifts. Raise your hand, just out of curiosity, if you've never studied spiritual gifts before. I just want to see if it's cool. Great. So, great. This is just, I'm so excited. So that's why I wanted to do this, because I always know that, hey, you're either brand new to the gifts, or guess what? Maybe someone taught you incorrectly about the gifts. So we're going to get it all out there. We're going to talk and understand what the spiritual gifts are. So let's just read the chapter, though, to get an idea of what Paul is saying. Now, verse 1, concerning spiritual gifts. Brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols. I love that. Dumb idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I made known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. 
There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. Take note. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. All made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. It is therefore not of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as capital He pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable on these, we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greatest mo greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. And there should be no division in the body, that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, take note, please, all the members suffer with it. For if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, variety of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do not all? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly seek the best gifts, and I shall show you a more excellent way. So we come to, for most of you, a very familiar passage on spiritual gifts. For your note taking, it is not the only chapter on spiritual gifts. So I want to first, in order for you to understand the Bible about spiritual gifts, you need to know all the lists. And it's for your homework assignment to go just read them. See what they are. So let me give them to you. You have this chapter, obviously. You have Romans chapter 12. You have Ephesians chapter 4, which we're going to be looking at in just a moment. Those are the three major lists. But don't leave out 1 Corinthians chapter 7 where it talks about the gift of marriage and if you have the gift of celibacy, uh, God bless you. I don't know many guys with that gift. I haven't met a woman yet with that gift, personally. But it's an incredible gift because you can do, Paul says, even more for the Lord without any cares. And then, of course, we can't forget, and I can't wait to get to, Chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, the greatest of the gifts, the agape love of God. And I'll spoil my message for three weeks in advance, but guess what? I don't care what gifts you and I have, they are useless without this gift. 
you don't have the love of God, guess what? <laughs> Read it. You don't sound good. You don't look good. Even though you think you may sound good and look good. And the last gift chapter is 1 Peter chapter 4. I love Pete. Simple Pete. He just writes, hey, listen, you got a speaking gift or you have a ministering gift. He makes it so easy. I like easy. I like simple. And you can categorize the gifts. You know, some scholars and some students of the Bible do about like speaking gifts and serving gifts or things of that nature. I don't care how you categorize them, but read them all. Before we get into anything else, I need to ask, this question. Who is responsible for giving you these gifts? How do you get the spiritual gifts? Well, 1 Corinthians 12, look in verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, speaking of the Holy Spirit, distributing to each one individually. Take note, as I said, as he wills. No man, no woman can just say, I can get this gift because someone says, come up and learn how to speak in tongues. That is blasphemous. You don't learn gifts. They're given to you. Let's just get that out there clear because I've been to churches where they say, you want this gift? Come out here and we're going to give you this gift. Like it's the showcase showdown at ShopRite. Or ShopRite. What's that show? Price is Right. No man has that ability. Right? The other place, certainly that I want you to turn to, and I ask you to do it, go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Because in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11, let me just read the first four words. And he himself gave. Let's be abundantly clear. There can be no human who says, I can give you a spiritual gift. It only comes from God himself. And when you read and study the Greek verb tenses, gave, we are passive in it. Which means I can't conjure it up and make it happen on my own so I can pull a gift out from heaven. You can pray all you want to receive a gift, but you're never going to get it unless God says, I want you to have it. Now, we are told and encouraged to seek after gifts. But it's up to God to decide whether you're going to get it or I'm going to get it. That is the first thing I want to make sure you all know. When you get the gifts, when do you get them? We might disagree. Some people might say you've had them ever since you were created. Some say you'll get it once you're born again. Some say you'll get them as you progress along. And I don't care which position you take, right? The bottom line is this. God gave you at least one gift. You've got to find out what it is. Understand what that gift is. It's on you to find that out because he gave it to you. You represent that part of the body that I need. I don't have it. So everyone should begin to study and pray and ask God, what gift or gifts do I currently have? Some may be revealed in the course of time. When I first got saved, I had no clue I was going to be a pastor. If you told me I was going to be, I would have punched you in your face. You're like, no way. I ain't going up there. This donkey? I have foot and mouth disease. I have an anger management problem. I have a lust issue. God doesn't want me to be a pastor. That's what I would have told you. <laughs> and like Jonah, I fought it. Whatever. Didn't want to do it, but here we are. You stuck with me. So after you've figured this out, the next question I have, because you need to understand the gifts. Why did God give you and me these spiritual gifts in the first place? 
Why did he do it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because, in, stay in Ephesians 4, look in verse 12 and 13. It's for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, so as a mature man or woman, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Your attention, please. God gave spiritual gifts to build His church. Right? And in doing so, it's the other side you may not think about. Because what did Jesus say in the book of Matthew? When he builds the church, not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. The gifts are meant not just to build you and I up, but to break that punk down. Tear down strongholds. Break chains. Set the captives free. Right? You now know how important these gifts are. This isn't like so God can just showcase us like trophies, right? It's meant so you and I, when we come into the unity, that's why it says we have to be one in the faith because if we don't work together and fight together, the enemy wins every time. Now here's the problem that can arise, because guess what? And I'm very sensitive to this fact. One of the things that gets people to stop being part of a church body is church hurt. And I've had, sadly, many conversations. And I've dealt with this personally. I'll tell you my testimony if you ask me. But it hurts to be broken by pastors and leaders and church plural all over the world. It happens. And when you're hurt by a church, the tendency is to want to stay away from the church. But how can we be one if you stay home? How can your gift be employed if you don't plug in? You see, when you get down to verse 14 about that we should no longer be the children tossed to and fro, take note, because of the trickery of men and in the cunning and craftiness, we always assume that's False teaching. Well, one of the false teachings that goes on in people's minds today is, I don't need to go to church. I don't need fellowship. I don't need to be part of a body. I can be spiritual all by myself. Show me that in the Bible. Show it to me. Because I'm showing you right now, you're wrong. Because if you're my arm, cut it off. There it goes. Can I still live without this arm? Can I still function without this arm? But does it make life hard for me? I'm right-handed. You cut this. My left arm is useless. We played the game of horse yesterday at our youth out, uh, group, and I couldn't make a bank layup with my left hand. I couldn't just do this. Get the ball in. It's like... I need you. Do you understand that? Your gift is vital to me. You're part, we are part, as long as we do ministry together, we're joined at the hip. We're connected. And it kills me when I hear people say, I don't need to go to church. Listen. Listen. The illustration I always give is this. Who here likes pizza? Raise your hand. Okay. Think of your favorite food if it's not pizza. Whatever that is. If you go to your favorite restaurant to get that specific food that you love so much, let's just stick with pizza for a second. If they burn it to a crisp and it tastes like cardboard, yeah, you might be upset, but maybe you come back and give it a Again, I know it's blasphemous, right? People that get steaks, you know, I used to just work in a high-end restaurant, right? And we're always told to push, hey, don't let anyone order this well done. That's what the chef would say. 
And then people come in, I want my steak well done. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm trying to encourage you not to burn it. I get why you do it for health reasons, or maybe, maybe it tastes better. Well, then I don't know. But if somebody burns your pizza over and over again, do you stop eating it? Do you? Not if you're me. I'm going to go somewhere else and get my pizza. So if a church or a pastor has hurt you or broken you, they've burnt you bad. It doesn't mean Jesus doesn't love you. It doesn't mean his word isn't the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Find a new home. Get plugged in where your gifts can be employed and can be used. I watch what's happening in our men's group and the women's group. It's so cool. When they show up, right, and someone's maybe afraid to ask a question or say something, and I'm like, no, please, come on, say it, say it, say it. We need to hear it. Then they do, and it opens up the floodgates of heaven. Tears are shed, and lives are truly, truly restored because when one hurts, we all hurt. You have a gift, and now we can help just all work together to build each other up. That's why you can't be the Lone Ranger. There's no lone rangers in Christianity. Yes, they had Tonto. And no Christian in here wears a cape and a Superman and can do it all themselves. But it takes a great humility to be able to say, I need you. It takes a great humility to be able to say, I'm struggling. And I need help. But you come connect to our family. Listen, we'll get you up and running. We'll get you restored because we have Jesus working overtime in this family. The Holy Spirit is moving and grooving. And what's funny is I've seen people with spiritual gifts who didn't even know they had it rise to the surface. That would never happen if they were never plugged in, working and serving together. Does that make sense? So if you've been hurt or broke by a pastor church, first off, you have to forgive them. It doesn't mean you have to go serve under them and go back to them, no. But you need to be healed of that first because as we're going to see, our gifts get tainted, if not put to the curb because of Bitterness, anger, unforgiveness. God can't use that. So we now know and have laid and established those facts, right? We understand where the gifts come from, who gives them, and why we get them. Jesus is calling someone. <laughs> it's okay. So now listen, come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And before we get into the laying out of the gifts, which happened to start in verse 7, let's just read down again and recap. Now concerning spiritual gifts, notice it's italicized in my Bible, because in the Greek it's not there. So concerning spiritual things, if you remember when Corinthians first opened, in chapter 1, Paul says that, I pray you went lacking any gift. So, again, the idea is we need every gift that God can possibly give us. Because the enemy, listen, talk to some of the people in this church. The church is under siege. The stuff that I am aware of and the degree of pain and brokenness, the enemy is killing and trying to kill us. That's the sign of a good, healthy church. But he is going to bring everything he has to pull us away from the body and get us to stop using our gifts. So concerning spiritual matters, brethren, don't be ignorant. Now again, that's, not, that's a word that you can be offended by. If I called you ignorant, you might want to just hit me. But it just simply means without knowledge. And it's my job to equip you and give you the understanding as I feed you. Know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols. However you were led, 
Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except the Holy Spirit. He reminds the audience that their past life, which was led by idolatry and false gods, they never spoke to them personally. Whenever I witness to someone, a Muslim, a Buddhist, I say, show me and tell me, how are you have a personal relationship where you see and experience God speaking to you on a personal level, and I never get an answer, because it only happens in the Christian faith. God speaks to me every single time I open this. And his voice is always crystal clear. But every other religion can't say that. Only we can say that. So he reminds them, right? These dumb idols. And worse yet, Paul said earlier that these demons was sort of how they were led by. You go to third world countries, you will see demon possession. Let me tell you, there are some really bad spirits that lead people in really bad directions. But the Holy Spirit is totally the opposite. So that's why he says, I make known to you. First off, you can't say you have a gift unless you're even saved. You can't call Jesus Lord. So the first gift we certainly need to throw out to you, you're here today and don't have a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with God and have asked Him to forgive you your sins, you're not going to understand any of this. And the gifts won't matter to you, nor they will they be important to you, because you need to have the gift of salvation first. Which sets the precedence. If you're saved by grace, what do I always say? We serve by grace. If you forget that, you serve in your own strength, in your own power, in your own way, and you will hurt a lot of people in the process. We don't get to do this because we think we just can. We should all be humbled to know that we get to do this only because the Lord said we can. When he saved us, called us by his mighty love, mighty power, mighty grace, and the gifts that he does decide to give to us, we don't deserve them either. But the problem is, is our culture doesn't understand that. Because we live with a mindset, a culture of achievement and advancement where gifts are given because like at Christmas time, you're good, you're naughty, you're nice. We live in the gift-giving culture where we're for promotion and advancement. Oh, okay, you got the new job, let's give you a gift. Oh, you got this, you give you a gift, right? It, it's somehow attached to something we are and we do. And God says, eh. survey says, eh. You deserve hell and death, Jim. You were once my enemy, but I loved you so much and I called you and saved you. And now I'm going to give you a gift so the world will know that I am alive. Do you understand that? Have you laid hold of that? So any time that this donkey gets to preach, it's only by God's marvelous grace and I don't deserve to do it. And I know, probably in this church alone, more qualified and better preachers than I am. It's just a humbling reminder of God's amazing, amazing love. And so he moves on in verse 4 to say, there are diversities of gifts, but take note, the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. If you circle the word for activities and circle for the word for works, in the Greek it's where you get the word energy from. You see... God energizes us. He gives us the gift and the power and the ability. We basically just wear him like a space suit. We're just spiritual astronauts walking around, giving people our gift. God provides it all. He works it all. And it's all, like it says, all in all. How much is that? That's a lot of all. 
But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. Take note for the profit of all. Do you understand your spiritual gifts are not even for you? Huh? Then why did you give it to me? Oh. He gave you a gift because everyone else needs it. Everyone else. The purpose of your gift is so you can give it to everyone else. But the Corinthian mindset, the reason they're so divided is because they lost sight of that. And they wanted to be heard. Listen to me preach. I'm the greatest pastor. I'm the greatest prophet. I'm the greatest evangelist. I'm the apostle. Yeah. No. <laughs> You're a sinner saved by grace. He's going to start the list of gifts. I like lists. It kind of makes it easy to follow. Before we get into this list, I want to give you, please, this may be new to some of you, I want to talk about three sort of important factors rely and relating to spiritual gifts, okay? Number one, the spiritual gifts may vary in strength from person to person. Because you're not the only pastor, you're not the only teacher, you're not the only administrator, gift of help, right? And in the Romans 12 passage, and in the 1 Peter passage, you find that God gives us according to our faith and our ability, right? When I first started preaching, and even to this day, I still think my messages are terrible. But guess what? I feel and believe that as I practice my gift and use the gift, to, it gets a little better, I hope. For your sake. <laughs> You're stuck listening to me, right? But it's just like anything else. If you don't ever use your gift, which is for next time's message, how can you ever grow in it and get good at it? So it does vary, but listen, listen very carefully. So some of you may be saying, well, Jim, I don't have the gift of evangelism, so therefore I don't have to share. Because I'm a scaredy cat. Is that what scripture teaches? When it says go and make disciples? Uh, you got a mouth. Do you know Jesus? And you got a mouth. That equals share. Right? Don't look at me. I didn't write the book. Some of us hide from... Oh, I can't do that because I don't have that gift. No, you will find when you read the gifts carefully... There's overarching principles that apply to all of us as Christians as we all need to share. How about teaching? Some of you are like, oh, I could never teach. Some of you fear coming to my How to Study the Bible group for men and women because I'm going to have to teach to this group? <laughs> right? It's been so fun to watch. People show up like, oh my gosh, I have to teach. Right? And then after they do it, they're like, when's next week? I did it! God helped me do it! I knew you could the whole time. So some of us need to just, need a little encouragement and a little poking and prodding. That's the shepherd's job. I take my root. Poke you. Hey, get to women's study. Come learn. Hey, get to men's study. Come learn. Right? How about the gift of love? I need this in traffic. Show mercy, right? You may not have the gift. I get it. I don't have all these gifts. But there are still the principles in the teachings of Scripture that says we ought to have them, at least part of it, and at least trying to do it. So I want to eradicate the fact you can't now say you're no longer ignorant. You have the understanding. Just because you don't have the spiritual gift like Billy Graham to go in front of 10,000 people and preach the gospel, you can at least go in front of one. Right? Can I get an amen? amen? Number two. Sometimes the gifts, multiple gifts, they have some overlapping. 
So for example, I'm the pastor. <laughs> what happens if the pastor doesn't have the gift of mercy or love? <laughs> we know what 1 Corinthians 13, that's why I can't wait to embarrass myself when we get there, right? But if I don't have the gift of mercy or love, did anyone ever see the original Karate Kid? Raise your hand. Right? Do you guys remember? Out here and in the streets, or in competition, a man confronts you, he is the enemy, and an enemy deserves no mercy. Some pastors sound like that. Where's the grace and love? Now listen, if you're an illustrating a point, I get it. But some don't have that gift, and they should. How can you be a pastor, a shepherd, and not love the sheep? How can that be? And some hide behind their bodyguards and their cronies and you can't even talk to them. Hello, you're the shepherd. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice, but I can't even talk to my own pastor. God, help me. We don't need Cobra Kai Christians. Cobra Kai was the name of the group in Daniel and Karate Kid of the like the bad karate guys, right? And what happens with the Cobra Kai teacher? No such thing as bad student, only bad teacher. Teacher say, student do. Mr. Miyagi. I memorized the movie in case you didn't know, right? <laughs> Some of you are like, wow, how do you remember that? Because the principle is so true. You have a bad, unmerciful, unloving, unkind pastor, he's going to teach his sheep to be the same. That's why I am terrified of my gift and humbled by my gift because I need to lead you by example. I need to demonstrate the very thing that I preach. And without God's love and God's grace and God's mercy, I can't do anything for you. I'm not perfect. And at some point, I am sure I will offend one of you, if not all of you. It is accidental, unintentional, I assure you. But please, because it's happened. You come up to me after service. Hey, this is what you said. Didn't like it. Hurt my feelings. Whatever. I'm, I can take that. And I will beg for your forgiveness. Because I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to help you. So, some gifts may overlap. And again, if you're in leadership, there better be some multiple examples of overlapping. Again, mercy, love. Those kind of things helps. Third thing I want you to know. In some cases when you read the spiritual gifts, they're differentiated by the person, or better yet, the office of the gift, as well as the activity of the gift. Right? Let me give you the example. Prophet or prophecy. This is going to be huge. Huge. Huge when we get to apostles and prophets, which right where we're going to, right next. But you'll see the difference between prophet and prophecy. Why is that? I'm glad you asked. Look down. We're going to actually start with these gifts first in verse 28 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Take note. And God has appointed these in the church first apostles. I'm going to give you my interpretation. So I need you to please take notes and I need you to listen up because I know that there are going to be denominations that probably disagree with me, but I will do my best to show you scripturally why this is true. The apostles. There were only 12 of them. Let's just start there. Jesus had many disciples, but he only had 12 apostles. Anyone that comes to you and says, I am the Apostle Yo-Yo, please, please, 
open your Bibles together and say, there is a qualification to be an apostle. A very serious, important one. Go to Acts chapter 1. Because you will hear of churches, I'm the apostle. In Acts chapter 1, I ask you to turn there, starting in verse 15. The context, Judas is dead, and Peter feels led by the Spirit to pick another apostle to replace him. So it says, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples altogether. The number of the names were about 120, and said, men and brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us, obtaining a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. Yum. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called in their own language, Akel Dama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let this dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Therefore, highlight 21. And 22, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, these must be witnesses to his resurrection. That's your qualification for a bona fide apostle. There is no exception. And usually when you meet people who call themselves by their title, they have their whole view of spiritual gifts wrong. Their attitude is wrong. Their understanding is wrong. And they want to let you know that I'm the man up in this place. I'm the apostle. Right? That's the requirement. So the office of the apostle is no longer needed. We'll touch on that in a minute when we do prophets. But, what does the Greek word mean? It means messenger or sent one. So guess what? We all are part of the small A team. Everyone has a mission because you're all being sent. Matthew 28, as you're going, wherever you find yourself, Jesus has you on a mission to make disciples, to win souls, right? So you are an apostle in that realm. The other way you know this, you don't have to turn there, but I want to just give you the verse. I lost my place. Sorry. Oh, here it is. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. Just write it down as a cross-reference. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. The other reason you know apostles, there are only 12. Jesus says there's 12 thrones in which they will be judging the tribes of Israel. Has that happened yet? No, it hasn't. It's reserved for 12 specific men. So anyone, and I always do this, when they come and they, I'm Apostle Bernard. Okay, B, let's talk. Where's your throne? Show me your throne. What tribe are you going to be judging? What are you talking about? No, what are you talking about? It's like, what, what's that show? What you talking about, Willis? Right? You need a throne. You need to have been there. You weren't there. So stop calling yourself a chief apostle. Okay? But there are messengers. There are sent ones. We all need them. Everyone is being sent. Number two. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Second, there are prophets. <laughs> or the gift of prophecy. But the office of the prophet. Again, some will disagree with me, and it's okay. 
When you read Ephesians chapter 2, it says, when God laid the foundation for the church, it was built on the doctrine of the apostles and prophets. Some would even argue from the grammar in the Greek, listen, that it's apostolic prophets. It's really one gift, one person. But even if you want to say prophets is a second, I'll give you that. They had the office of planting the first church. Because I need you to hear this. If you don't like me, there's a lot not to like. If you don't like this church or the way I teach, what happens? You go out the doors, and next door, you find another church. But what happened if you were back then? There was only one church. So what happens? You stop going to church altogether. There wasn't just this church down the street and this church around the block, and I'm going to go shop churches like I'm looking for a new pair of shoes. Right? There was no other church. So until they could officially all be laid, God used the apostles and the prophets to do so. Ephesians chapter 2. Oftentimes, those men had lots of gifts because they went into a brand new section of the world where the gospel was never preached. Does anyone know here today an area in the world where the gospel has not yet gone. If you're, because I get the question, what about the guy on the island? Everybody's worried about the spiritual Gilligan Island, about the man somewhere lost on an island. I'm like, tell me, where is this island? And they never tell me. So you're talking about a guy or a girl that doesn't exist then. Name me the island where the gospel hasn't gone. I love challenging people who ask that. What about the person who hasn't heard the good news? And this is just free information, by the way. So I say to them, well, maybe you're the apostle sent to the no island. You know where that person is or don't know. Go find them and go tell them then. Because now that you know, you should go tell them. Right? And God will give you every gift under the sun to win them to Christ. So go do it. I don't want to leave here. Well, then why are you arguing with me? Just get saved. Or just believe, or whatever the case is, right? But, back to the prophet. Why do I bring this up? Ready? Now, and we're going to talk more about this when we actually get to chapter 14 on the gift of prophecy. But here's where I'm going. If you still say there are modern prophets today, who still, with bad interpretation, because a prophet was someone back then, ready? They would get an immediate revelation from the Lord to be able to teach the Word in a church service. Why? Because not everyone had Bibles. They, when was the printing press invented, ladies and gentlemen? Does anybody know? I hear numbers. Do I have one? Do I have... Right? No. So until this could be mass replicated... Societies thrive, in churches thrive. One or two maybe copies of the scripture. That's it. We take for granted what we have. But they didn't have that luxury. So God had to give them human Bibles speaking through the gift of prophecy who would give a message. Now it's done through pastors and teachers people like yourself, you can teach and share the Word of God. You don't necessarily need this gift. Now, if you go to a third world country and you don't have your phone because there's no internet, what a great day that might be. No more gizmos. Throw them all away. Let's get back to the real deal. Right? But here's what happens. Ready? Let me just read this to you real fast. What are prophets? This comes from one of the homepages from Mormons. The authority to speak and act in the name of God has been given to prophets since the time of Adam, and it is a vital part of the plan of salvation. The word prophet, I love how they try to sound smart, comes from Greek, which means inspired teacher. That's deceiving. And indeed, that is the primary role of the prophet, to teach the gospel. Well, that's partially true. While God's commandments and principles are constant, the world we live in is not. Different periods throughout time have brought each with them new circumstances and unique challenges. 
prophets receive revelation from God in order to help his people navigate through their own distinct times. Prophets are special witnesses of God. They are revelators. They teach and perform miracles and they lead. And then it goes on to say, the first of these latter-day prophets was Joseph Smith, a man called by God in 1830. And he, in the same way like the ancient prophets and apostles, came from among the most humble and unlikely candidates. This farm boy grew up, and he's the one that started. He's their founding father. And listen to this. The farm boy from upstate New York became God's instrument for the considerable temporal work required to restore the truths out, structure and authority of Jesus Christ Church here on earth. After centuries of apostasy, that is apostasy, that is blasphemous. After centuries of apostasy, Joseph Smith spoke with God, received revelation from him, revealed and translated an ancient religious record called the Book of Mormon, and brought back to earth the church of Jesus Christ in its fullness. I'm ready to throw this phone out the door. Because that's what happens. You get people that say, I have this gift of being a prophet. Don't listen to your Bibles. Don't listen to church history. Just listen to me. You should run. Put your sneaks on. Track stars. Run as fast as you can from men and women who say these things. I heard from God. It better be from here. And when we get to 1 Corinthians 14, doesn't Paul say, Your, what you say is subject to the rest of us. So I can look at you and say, that verse and that chapter will contradict what you say. You need that's you're a false prophet. Right? What happened in the Old Testament to false prophets? They got stoned, and it wasn't just a bad overdose on like some marijuana. They were killed if one thing they said, just one, didn't come to pass. Worse yet, the Book of Mormon says another testament. They got the audacity to contradict Galatians. I believe it's chapter 1. It says, Paul writes, if anyone preaches any other testament, let them be eternally cursed. But we got Joseph Smith, farm boy. He knows. He heard. That's why you all need to be Bereans. Study for yourself. See what I say is true. Can God give and use the gift of prophecy? If you're again in a missionary world in a sense or and just a verse comes to mind and it applies and brings conviction and change? Absolutely. I, and listen, people will tell you about dreams. People ask me about dreams. I dream every night. Some of them are really weird. I always associate it to like, I don't know, bad pizza, you know, I ate too late, whatever. And I don't claim to have the discerning of dreams, but I say this just to say God showed up one time, and I had a dream about a friend of mine where he, he was married, and in the dream, his name was Greg, in the dream, Greg comes to me and says, hey, Jim, guess what, my wife is pregnant, and then I woke up, and I'm like, that is that about? And I just let it marinate because I couldn't get it out of my head. And it was just randomness, complete randomness, right? I ran into Greg about a week and a half later. This is days of blockbuster video, right? So I said, Greg, I can't believe you're here. And before I could say anything, he goes, Jim, you're not going to believe it. My wife is pregnant. I'm like, I knew that. He goes, I didn't tell you. I, my God told me. Apparently. So can it happen? Sure. But red flags, that is not primarily how we hear from God. This is how he's going to speak. So if you ever tell me you have a dream, you tell me God told me to use my gift, and it contradicts Scripture, I'm going to call you on it. 
I'm going to call you on your humility, right? Because with these kind of gifts, with the speaking gifts in particular, listen, you will use your gifts and they should be used primarily first for the Savior, number one, for the saints, number two, because they're not for you. They're for everyone else. And if you use them right, your humility will produce harmony, which leads to maturity. Your humility breeds harmony because I want your gift. I want to be, I want your gift flowing together in our body. I need it. It's blessing me. It's helping me. However, your pride will only produce problems. When the focus becomes on you and how good you think you are. Some people have said to me, Jim, I once preached to a thousand men. Or kids, I got to lead a hundred people to Christ. Just by the tone of the statement and the statement itself, boy, you're awfully high on yourself. If anything good comes from me, anything good, it's not because I'm good. It's not because I'm some eloquent speaker or know the word. It's only because there's one that's good and that is Jesus. So we can't be selfish. We have to be selfless. Your pain caused by your pride only brings division to the body. And listen, it's the church, it's the bride that the gifts are being used for. Let me ask you, how does it feel to know if you're not using your gifts in a loving, appropriate manner that you are beating up the bride of Christ? That's what you're doing. That's what I'm doing. When I use my spiritual gifts, the wrong way, the wrong motive, I'm giving Jesus' bride a black and blue eye. That should bring some quick humbleness and correction to the way I operate. Listen, in marriage, I, call, I called it a gift. If you found out I'm beating my wife and I'm sleeping around, having relationships with other women, but coming here every Sunday saying, listen to me, listen to the word. What would you say to me? Find another church. That's right. Get out of here as fast as you can. That's right. Are we using our gifts today in a humble, Lord, it's just what you want, not even what I want. Are you hurting people with your gift? Are you saying to others, hey, I'm called to this, and woman or man or whomever, you better just get with the program because I'm on a mission. Where's your accountability for your gifts? What men, do you have men in your life to hold you accountable for how you act and how you use these gifts? You can't be the Lone Ranger because guess what? If I find out you're using it in a wrong manner, I'll come find you anyway. My spiritual gift, I'm the bulldozer. Most of you know that, right? I plow the hard ground. I say the hard things. I'm the Nathan. I just accepted it. Women, do you have those holding you accountable for your gifts? Because I want your gifts employed here. Listen, the point again is every gift should be employed. Let me put it to work and put it to use. Come tell me. Do you have a heart for ministry? A heart to do it. But we're going to do it by the book. We're going to do it by the word. Don't tell me what you think should be done. It's got to be done this way. There's no other way. Both with action and with attitude. So after the prophets, third teachers... I don't think that needs a lot of explanation. Those who teach Sunday school, kids ministry, in men's discipleship, that's the men are teaching the men and the women are teaching the women, as the Bible says it should be. After that, miracles. Circle the word for miracles. It's the Greek word for dunamis. So it's any ministry, anything where God's supernatural power is at work at stake. The gifts of healings. This is another one that's kind of 
rubs me the wrong way. The name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, health and wealth gospel. If you really have the ability to heal at whim, whenever you can call down God's dunamis power, then do me a favor. My own daughter needs your help. My own daughter needs your help. She has a couple more surgeries, and if you really can heal, lay your hands on her and let all her fingers be normal. Let her palate be closed. Let her nostril be right. Let everything be made right. But for you to sit here, not you, those teachers, and say to me, I lack faith or there's sin in my life, and that's why she's not healed, I'm going to go to my Wing Chun school and we're going to get it on. Because that's how it makes me feel. I'm not going to do that. Don't take that literally. I'm, I have to love my enemies. But if you have the gift of healing, come with me to chop. Empty the hospital out. Wouldn't that be sweet? Come visit some of the marriages that we know and let's see them healed. Show me that you really can do this gift. Man, I can employ it. But don't tell me you can just do it whenever you want. And then when it doesn't happen, you blame it on the person. That is so wrong. And in our area around here, this is predominant. This is a growing thing. Helps. Boy, listen, our church could use a lot of help. We need people to run the soundboard. We need people to greet. And usher, we need people all over the place. Helps is widely best. So whatever thing you can do to help us, please. Administration. You're organized. I know some of you are very detailed and organized people. We could use you. Hence the reason I have no bulletins. I need an administrator. I need help. Variety of tongues. We'll talk on that when we get there. And then, of course, notice, are all apostles, all prophets? It's emphatic that there's no in all of them. Back in verse 6, I know I kind of went the other way because I started with the majors. But then, I'm sorry, down in verse 8, there's the word of wisdom through the Spirit and to the word of knowledge. It's the only time this shows up in the Bible. I really just simply believe that a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge is in a moment's time, just God gives you a wise word to say. Wisdom on how to handle a certain situation that could be precarious, tough to know. Listen, we go through some radically hard things and hard decisions to be made. I believe God will give you that wisdom in the time that you need it. It also could be Hey, maybe you know a, a seasoned saint like Dad Bender, been a Christian for so long, just been around the block a hundred thousand times. He probably just has wisdom hanging and oozing out of his pockets, right? So just ask him if you need wisdom. Before, well, first ask God, then ask him. <laughs> and to another faith. That's a big one. Man. And I'm running out of time. Shoot. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy, discerning of spirits. Okay, we've touched on these um, tongues, interpretation of tongues. Again, the point is, is that God gives as He wills. But I want to end with this. Turn with me to Matthew 25. This is where we close. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talks about the parable of the talents. And I'm not going to read because we're out of time. But I, for homework, read it. But what I want to summarize and say is this. Everyone has a gift. Everyone was given a talent. Look in verse 15. One he gave five talents, another two, another one, according to his own ability. A talent in that day was like 20 years wages. So that's a pretty heavy duty amount. When you got saved and God gave you a spiritual gift or multiple gifts, 
are you not way richer than that? If you've been with us in the men's group, we've been going through Ephesians talking about the immeasurable riches in Christ. You all have been given at least one. Do you want to squander 20 years wages and do nothing with it? Because the person who does nothing with their gift, when you get to the end, it's unprofitable. Verse 30, outer darkness is where that servant goes and it's the weeping and gnashing of teeth. You can't be a disciple. You can be a believer and do nothing, but you can't be a disciple and tell me you have no gift and do nothing for the body of Christ. Jesus is extreme here. Now it's a parable, so don't build doctrine on it. But the point is still pretty serious. Everybody needs to look, how can I employ my gift in the body here at Redeemed, and how can the gift translate out there? You're held accountable for this. God gave you and rescued you this and said, now do something for me. What are you doing and how currently are you using your gifts? Or are we sitting, moping, and just in the muck of our sin and depression? And I can't do anything. I'm useless. I'm this. No, you're none of those things. Stop that. Ask the Lord to show you how you can serve. How you can help. Because I need you, and He needs you to do the things that He's given you to do. Amen? We made it. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time in your word. Help us, O oh Lord, to understand and to figure out what our giftings are, how they can be employed, and again, even more importantly, to use them in the right manner, with love, with absolute humility, understanding they're given to us by grace. We don't deserve them. We don't deserve them. So how can we just use them in an inappropriate manner? Humble us, Lord. Show us, Lord, how we can best employ these gifts and serve the body until you come, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us over and above anything we could ever ask or imagine. Thank you for this family. I ask that you bless them as they go their way. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. We will pick up with the rest of the chapter with me in two weeks. Next week is uh, Ed, and then the following week I'll be, oh no, yeah, then Gabe, so three weeks.